this computer. So um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Araminta and along with Annie, we manage and host the FinTech Marketing Slack group. And today I'm really excited to be chatting with Liz and Alison. Um, a bit of a, an explanation on how this event will go. The first 45 minutes, we'll be chatting about uh, Liz and Alison's book and more things about brand first thinking uh, with financial institutions. And then towards the last 15 minutes, we'll do a Q&A. So feel free to add questions into the chat as we go along. Um, you'll also all receive the recording afterwards. So about think like a brand, not a bank. Um, in this book, Alison and Liz show banks and credit unions how to embrace their brand and reap the benefits. Um, they talk about the five principles for growth, how to shift your mindset, apply each principle, utilize branding strategies uh, for sustainable growth, along with um, insights and some really cool real life examples. So let's just get started. Uh, would you mind um, giving us a bit of an introduction uh, and your, your backgrounds? Let's just start with you, Liz. Okay, so um, I'm Liz High. I have spent probably the last, I don't know, but I like to say 20 plus years working in um, predominantly on the agency side. So really focusing on helping a whole range of brands, everything from technology through to my, my kind of passion, which is financial services and fintech, to build brands, grow their businesses, think differently about their audiences and customers. Last couple of years, um, I've spent focusing on launching and supporting fintech brands. So met Alison working with uh, Kony and uh, worked together at, at Nimbus, bringing both of those brands um, into the market. So very passionate brand marketer and um, very um, focused right now on the financial sector. Yeah, Hi, I'm Allison. I, I was telling Liz I feel very American on this uh, on this call. Um, so, uh, Allison Netzer, um, I've been uh, you know similar to Liz, twenty plus years. Um, you know, working uh, not only we were talking about sales before everyone uh, joined, so both on the sales and the marketing um, side of things in very large companies like uh, Dell Technologies all the way to a, a six person uh, media startup. So kind of in everywhere in between. Um, like Liz, tremendous amount of passion for brands. Um, I think our, our friendship and our partnership in the book is um, probably pretty reminiscent about from what a lot of people on this call experience. Liz is extremely analytical and data driven. I am extremely not those things and I am emotion first. Um, and so it takes the combination of course um, of those things to, to create a brand and to get other folks on board. So uh, just really happy to be speaking with everyone today. Yeah, thank you for both for coming on. Um, and you yeah. published your book in September, is that right? We did, we did. Yeah, it seems like yesterday. No, no, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, published <laughs> in September. Um, it's, it's really, it's available in all formats, depending on how you like to, to consume your reading. Um, and, and also you'd mentioned in one of the emails, uh, very it's fortunate that it's a, um, it's a best you know, brand so. Sorry, let me mute uh, yeah, that. Yeah, Go on, there was someone who was... Yeah, yeah, no problem. I was just saying, so it's um, uh, the best-selling book at the moment. Uh, of course, that changes every day, but um, but we've been very fortunate um, in that regard. It's, it's had a positive reception. I'm just typing in the discount code uh, you kindly gave us. So if anyone here wants oh, to get sure. it, I will yeah. I'll be uh, sending the link. But yeah, so, so let's just start from the beginning. Um, obviously, you wrote this book because you saw that there was a problem, right? Which is that banks have a very different way of thinking when it comes to branding, and you really, you feel that they should be taking a brand first approach. So what, why is this the case? Like, what are the problems with how banks view branding? Why is there that kind of clash between these two concepts and worlds? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think banks and, and really most businesses um, really view, we've all experienced this, probably view branding as logos and colors, right? And the point we're trying to make in the book is that brand is not soft and fluffy. Uh, brand is not a marketing exercise either. Um, there's really a strong business case for brands. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how to sell 
uh, infernally. Um, we share a lot of data in the book and on our website um, to help folks do that. But one data point that really stands out is in a recent Harvard uh, Business Review study, those that are emotionally connected to a financial brand are 35% more valuable than those aren't. Uh, that, that aren't. So kind of the, the problem with seeing it as logos and colors and also seeing it again as it's just something that, that marketing does, right? There's a need to understand where brand lives. Um, I, I think we have a great graphic in the book and I'll, I'll make sure to send it across where it shows where people think brand lives, right? Which is the visuals, where we need to show that brand lives, which is the messaging. And then what that visible brand is built on, the position, the promise, the value, the purpose of the company. So, um, you know, it's, it's a problem, but I know it sounds silly, but it's also an opportunity, especially for those in FinTech because of this way of thinking, it opens up a lot of opportunities, product opportunities, business opportunities as well. Yeah, I think my favorite, um explanation, well, data point that you use in the book is that in 2020, during the, when the pandemic happened, the MSCI World Index dropped 73% and the S&P 500 dropped 51%. And uh, the brand portfolio, there's this like index that tracks companies that have uh, very valuable brands. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, yep, that's right. And, and they dipped just 42%. And right. they recovered its value in just 15 weeks, twice as fast as the rest. Is that, yeah. that's right, right? That's, yeah. that is exactly right. Yep, yep, exactly right. <laughs> I thought that was job. a very interesting, well, no, I, yeah. I had it here, don't worry. I wasn't memorizing <laughs> it, but, okay. but um, I think that's a really interesting case. And I kind of want to ask the question, like, okay, what was their definition of a brand? Because obviously, like, if they asked that question, what would you answer? These companies that were on that index, how did they, yeah. to them, what, how did they define that? So we, we chose that index on purpose because it supported our point. Uh, sure. <laughs> because it yeah. didn't, it didn't, it doesn't measure brand and I'll let you know, Liz speak to this because she, she chose it, but they didn't, they didn't define or measure brand in that kind of way that we're saying not to do so, sure. right? So like, brand impressions or recognition of, of the visual brand. It was more around emotional connection, recall and response, sort of the ways that you would really, when you, when you think as a marketer about a, a good brand, that's sort of how they defined it. Yeah. yeah. I think it yeah, just so really they helped. added, Sorry, they added things like um, employee experience. Mm. They add in things like growth metrics. So when they're identifying, you know, who the top 150 is every year, they probably measure about a thousand different companies through this indexing process, but it's all about what the outcomes of the brand would deliver. Mm -hmm. So how your customers feel, how much your business is growing, how much you're leading in your category. So it's a very holistic measure of what a brand is. Yeah, and I think the, the most useful part of this, of course, is that you can then go, if you're a CMO or you're, you work in marketing, you can then go to your boss or to the leadership team and say, look, there is a business case, there is a value in a brand, this is why we need to work on it. And we're going to talk about that in a second, more, more on that. But before that, would you mind walking us through the principles in your book and what, yeah, what are, what are those, what do those entail? Oh, wow. Well, I also did not memorize it all, so I have it written here because I knew you were going to ask. Uh, sure, and I, yeah. I hate it because I always forget one of them. And it's super awkward. Um, so we have five principles in the book. Um, my favorite is, is sometimes do the counterintuitive thing. Uh, the second one is embrace tension and create contradictions, which I also love. Uh, third is cue the remix which if you have any individual contributing marketers on this call, they all know about how to remix things. Um, product isn't what it used to be. And then Liz's favorite, which is, which is coach and compose. Um, so we can break these down kind of real quick, just sort of one yeah, by one. Um, so on sometimes do the counterintuitive thing. Uh, one of the examples we include in the book is the story of Partners Federal Credit Union, which is the credit union for all of the Disney companies, 
so Pixar, like all the 110 Disney companies. So in their quest to become more, more digital and improve the digital experience, they actually went completely face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one when developing their digital strategy, which when you say it out loud, doesn't really make sense, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty counterintuitive. Um, one of the but one of the main drivers behind doing the counterintuitive thing it's it's not just to do it just to do the contrary thing right it's really to fight binary thinking right banks and fintechs and especially as marketers the folks that we work with tend to think black and white thinking right and so when you approach banking with a binary mindset instead of a brand mindset you'll view things as high risk or low risk profitable, not profitable, you know, digital brick and mortar, go on and, you know, so on and so forth. But that really limits growth because there's so much opportunity in the middle, right? We were talking before everyone joined about virtual events and physical events and kind of, you know, what are the opportunities in the hybrid in the middle? Um, so it, there's so much opportunity between the two posts. And that's, that's really the freeing aspect of thinking like a brand. It doesn't have to be this or this tremendous amount right between between the two um so that's that's the first one doing the counterintuitive thing and we have other examples in there um of people doing somewhat crazy things uh that that work out really well um liz do you want to take embrace tension and create contradiction sure so um again the whole idea i mean i think the first two are quite linked in that you know as humans we are behaviorally conditioned to run away from things that feel a little bit uncomfortable but actually you know as someone who's worked in innovation and you know creative marketing for a long time sometimes the things that feel a little bit uncomfortable are the times when you'll make a really big breakthrough so a big part of the message in that one is that you know give yourself permission to step out of your comfort zone and you know sometimes you have to have challenging conversations sometimes things that don't feel like the right thing to do you just have to have a go actually yesterday um the one of the people that i was on a similar call to this brought up this in their company or their bank they talk about this idea of trying something on for size so mm. this whole kind of test and learn thing um, a good example that, you know, I think both Alice and I love in this one is we talk about um, the, the birth of Elvis and um, Sally Kroshek and um, her real passion to challenge all of the conventional thinking around women and money and women and investing, and that she was totally prepared against the data, um, against everybody's advice to put her own kind of personal career and her own money to, to fund that. And I think, again, there's a lot of stats in the book that, that talk about how successful she has been because she challenged the norm and she did something that on the outside felt really unconventional, uncomfortable for a lot of people, but it's proven to be successful. So it really is that step out of your comfort zone and be prepared to try things on for size and to test and learn. Oh, good stuff. So next one, third one is cue the remix. So, um, you know, if you read the book or just if you're kind of just into the topic, um, there's a, I think a kind of a dangerous temptation to, to throw everything out and, and start from a, a blank sheet of paper, right? Make wholesale changes. It's like throw the old brand out, bring the new brand in. And, and as fun as that can be sometimes, we, we want people to resist that resist that temptation. Um, and the reason for that is when you throw everything out and start at zero, mathematically and strategically, you lose the momentum of the things that were working. And even if you're a de novo or a new bank or a new FinTech, you still have momentum. If you had no momentum, you would not get any funding. If you had no momentum, you wouldn't have anyone sign up for your board. So, you know, as marketers, we're extremely self-critical uh, of ourselves and, and of the work we do. But, but you realizing that you have momentum is incredibly important. And then, you know, 
when you say you're into brand thinking, people think big and they think expensive and all of these things. And we really encourage folks to, to start small, to spend the effort up front, to really try to make the decision smaller for your colleagues inside of your company, for your customers. Making that decision smaller is how you build momentum. Um, so you look first at what you have and what you should do rather than what you can do when you're talking about remixing. Um, and if you really want to embrace remixing, one of the things we talk about is adopting a broader definition of what your remix ingredients are, right? It's not just your marketing assets or your previous content calendar. Really nothing is off limits. A, a big part of the chapter on remixing is redefining what materials are available to you as you start to think like a brand. So going to Liz's point about giving yourself permission when you're trying to remix what you have, think a lot more broadly than just maybe what you personally have, have had your hands on. Um, so that's, you know, that's just part of, and it's in the middle of the book for, for a reason, right? Because, you know, you get you get amped up on this idea of thinking more like a brand. You want to bring massive change. You're not thinking yet about how hard it's going to be. And then you reach that middle where you're just like, oh, shit. Excuse me. Like, oh, man, like this is going to be really hard. Do I really want to do this? Do I really want to start from scratch? And our answer is no, you do not want to start from scratch. You want to take yourself at your highest momentum point and then go even further. Um, and that's really what queuing the remix is, is, is about. Um, just a quick question on that. What, what are yeah. some examples of, I like what you said, you can start with something small because that feels like actionable. Mm -hmm. What are some mm -hmm. examples that you've seen of um, larger financial institutions or banks that have been able to do small steps and maybe doesn't require going to the board or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want to avoid that at all costs. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Well, one, uh, we, we may get in this example with the next uh, next principle, but one very small thing sort of around making the decision smaller is recognizing that product is not a language. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a chart in the book. But for, so for banking, treasury management is how a bank would refer to things on their printouts, on their website, whatever. It's really cash flow to a person. Yeah. And the person is who you're trying to get to do treasury management, right? So even just a small thing of going through your website and saying, you know what, product is not a language. How can I go through and redo this with more of a brand focus in mind, which is focused on that mutual value between yourself as the brand and that, that customer, right? They want a way to manage their cash they don't know what the heck treasury management is, right? So even something small like that, which is pretty palatable to most people <laughs> within a FinTech or within a bank, but it, it starts this mindset. It's like, well, yeah, like, I think we might be using the wrong language, Bob. Yeah, I think we are. And then it, then it flows into your decks and then it kind of starts flowing into your conversations. And before you know it, you're not just talking about the speeds and feeds anymore. You're actually talking. Uh, yeah. And then you, then you can get much more creative when you're actually using language um, as opposed to labels. So um, so that, that might just be one way to start. Yeah, I like that. So start with like normal language. Another example I think that you use is, and, and we see this all the time, right? You go to a bank's website and it's like 5% or 0% interest rates or, uh, credit card with well zero percent interest rate or savings rate, and it's true. Like customer, even me, like I read that, I'm like I, I don't care. Like, <laughs> yeah, what does that, that get me? Right, right, yeah. right. And I and I get yeah. it. Right, the bank has probably worked very hard to get yeah. the approval to do the zero percent and all of those things. Um, but that, yeah, that's not that's not brand thinking, right? That's that's thinking like a bank, yeah, and not a brand, right? Like the yep. whole, yeah. yeah that that's a great example. One of the, the exercises that we encourage people to do in the book is to, and you know, apologies if anyone works for the institution, but you could pick any of the large banks, go and log on to the Bank of America website, look it up, then go look at Square, 
or, or mm. blocks is now, yeah? And that just absolutely personifies the difference between bank and brand thinking. And I think, you know, even, you know, if you go back and you're having a conversation with your team leader or, you know, someone in your, your leadership team, just go, okay, you know, if I look at this, this is how a brand think, hey, look at our website. And just yeah. having some of those benchmarks to start those conversations going, because it's really hard to argue with that highly visual example. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is also a comment to the fintechs out there that are also adopting this language. Like I see in the UK, we had Goldman uh, launch Marcus. Well, now they're shutting, well, they're not shutting down, but they're pivoting it. And the, the main USP of Marcus was, I can't remember, like higher savings rate of 1.5%. And it's like, I feel like that's not enough. You can't, that's not a USP for a customer. Or what, right. what do, you say, do you agree with that? Or No, I, I would totally agree, right? Because yeah. it's, Again, going back to the, the business case, most businesses are not saying, I'm having trouble with conversion or transaction. They're having trouble with acquisition and retention. And acquisition and retention are driven by the emotional connection. And you do not have an emotional connection with an interest rate. <laughs> if now you could be in the outlier. You could be like, no, actually, transaction and conversion is is what I'm, and which is cool. Yeah. Like that is totally fine. Um, and in that case, that may be the right place for you. So we're by no means these are not universal principles. These are majority principles. But going back to the business case, if that is what you're trying to solve, right? If you were trying to build momentum, if you were trying to to do the lifetime value you do have to create the emotional connection, fortunately or unfortunately, and the language that you use, the way that you approach it, essentially the brand personality is what's going to get you there much faster than the approach of get them in the door with the, you know, the loyalty bit and then try to nurture them, mm -hmm. right? You can't really nurture something you don't have a relationship with. You can't nurture someone else's baby. You can only nurture yours. So it's very weird to me how people are like, we have to nurture these people. And I'm like, but you didn't give an S about them getting them in the door or know anything about them. So what are you nurturing exactly, right? Yep. You're, nurturing a you're nurturing a metric at that point. Uh, sorry, I get really fired up about that. No, but, this um, is, yeah, yeah, totally agree. No, I think this should be written down and plastered on a wall. Like it's just so true and yeah. you're totally right. And I feel like, but I, I'm also saying this because I've worked with FinTech companies like this where they're like, let's just give them free money. You know, we'll give you, you know, 10 pounds if you open an account yeah. with us. It's like, yeah. it's a gimmick. And sure, yeah, it's, it gives you numbers which you can then use to get more VC funding, right? Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, does it work to get real customers? Yeah. Well, and, and psychologically, I, I get it, right? If you are a, a fintech or any kind of new business, you spent the last nine months wanting people to give you free money. You're wanting funding, right? So yeah. it's very hard to remember that you're not the target customer. So there is a psychological thing that kind of happens, which is, well, of course people want free money. Of course people want some big reward. That's what I've been doing, right? That's why I dropped out of college to start this company. Um, but we're not the target customer. So it's a very good point. Yeah, so, so sorry, yeah. I could spend all day on that. But the next principle is yeah. um, product isn't what it used to be, which I completely agree with. Um, Liz, do you want to take that one? Sure. I think that you know, traditionally banks have been very product focused. That example I just talked about, go look at the Bank of America website, it's dripping with product. Everything is organized around product. Your board is probably organized around product. Um, you know, you've got your lending officer, et cetera. But particularly for the younger generation that are coming through, uh, younger millennials, Gen Z, then organizations that have purpose that you align your values to are the organizations that you'll choose to do business with and that is a trend that is only increasing and banks cannot you know the conversation you've just had in the good old days when it was you know you, you joined your parents bank you joined the bank on the corner that isn't the way that that finance gets transacted by people today so creating a story and meaning around your bank and one of the things that we're very keen to point out is that 
mission statement is not the same as, as a mission and mission is not the same as a purpose. Uh, again, one of the exercises that we do in the book is we just pulled a you know, load of mission statements from banks and credit unions and they're all the same. They all promise that they're here for their customer or member first, that you know, they're part of the community, but it's not intrinsic to who they are as an organization and how they are behaving. It's almost, it's a marketing tool. And it comes back to saying that, you know, product is about every single interaction, everything that you say now, and it is about what you stand for in the market. Now, obviously products are critically important, it's what you sell, but the book is really questioning whether that's how you should define yourself anymore. And we believe that it's not. Yeah, I, if I could just add to it, you know, we start each chapter with a little quote and there's one in this chapter from Seth Godin. I think he says it best where he says, mm -hmm. don't find customers for your products, find products for your customers, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we know you have to sell products. Like we're not anti-product. Mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're anti is I think the false business case between being product first, right? And the what we're fast finding is that the, the value of a dollar are the values behind the dollar, right? And, yeah. you know, that's where the, the brand is, right? We, we talked about at the beginning, where does brand live? Where does it kind of manifest? And a lot of it is in your values and your brand as a company. So creating that shared unit of value, which is not the rate to your point, because you're like, I don't care what the rate is. I don't need 10 pounds or whatever, hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, that shared unit of value is why product isn't what it used to be. Cause that used to be, yeah. I think this is important and I'm going to chuck it to you and you're going to pay me for it. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing shared about that. Right. So, um, the higher value, not just philosophical, but the higher monetary value is creating that shared unit of value. Nice. All right. Last, 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 last but not least. I'm like really impressed with these them. notes, by the way, Alison. I think they're really well. Um, um, well thank nice. you. I, I appreciate that. I found uh, I found my printer uh, in the oh. basement, and so I put it to use this morning. Nice. And I'm I'm actually I'm kind of into it now. That's yeah. Very organized. I might just, yeah, I'm gonna print out my grocery list later instead of looking at my phone every time I go past an aisle. All right. So last but not least, um, and it is really important if you do choose to read the book to to read the principles in order because we have this one at the end for a reason. Um, Coach and Compose is about how you how to bring your organization and your customers on this new brand thinking, right? That hopefully by this point you're like super fired up about. Um, and we try to use both bank and non-bank examples in each chapter. Um, one of my favorite non-bank stories involves whiskey, which I enjoy, soccer, which I also enjoy, and country music which I enjoy and Liz does not. So that's, that's where we're, we're different on that. Um, so it's the story of, of Marcus Whitney and the Nashville Soccer Club. Um, it's, the, it's about the experience that they composed and really how Marcus and his team literally coached the Major League Soccer Organization and Nashville, which if you're familiar, not, does not have the bearings of a soccer first culture by any means. <laughs> Um, but he, they literally coached and composed their way to now being the top, if not one of the top, if not the top, um, cities for soccer and, and teams. So coaching composed is really about acknowledging that, you know, like, just like we're talking about now, the brainstorming session isn't over when this meeting adjourns, right? That's actually when the, the real work begins. And so we try to give some steps on to, you know, how to, how to shepherd the changes basically to, to implementation. So that's the, the last, the last principle. Yeah. And I think if we come back to talking about, you know, how can you start small and how can you do things as an individual? This is one place where there's a real opportunity to become like a brand champion. So you are, you are exhibiting coaching behaviors, you know, you are, thinking more like a brand, you are applying the principles to your daily practice. And that's how you start to influence people. And, you know, hopefully you'll see, you know, improvements in the metrics that you are, you know, challenged with. And kind of proving out as the coach and the composer of new experiences that 
operate within your team or even within your individual role, this is where you can start to become a little brand champion within the organization as well. So we've, t we've taken, um, so thank you for going through all the principles. And now I'm curious to see how we can apply those to fintech. So, you know, this is um, most of the people in our group are working at fintech companies. Um, and by default, by being a fintech, you're basically saying you want to do things differently than banks. And that would involve mm -hmm. branding, right? Uh, however, as we just talked, there are some fintechs that do fall into the trap of doing, you know, 10 pounds for free or whatever it is, because, you know, that's just, that's what everyone else is doing or it's what banks are doing. And they're obviously successful to some degree. So I guess my first question is, those five principles and this brand first thinking, how, how can fintechs apply that? Like, what have you seen work? Uh, do you think it's easier for them, perhaps, because they have less legacy? What, what are your thoughts about the fintech ecosystem? I don't think it's, I don't think it's easier. Uh, I'll say oh, that. Um, no, I don't. Um, because I think, you know, there's more pressure mm -hmm. on an artist than there is on an office worker. Right. I mean, they, just the there's an there's a built in pressure to fintech that you have to be different, that you have to come up with something. You know, you have to basically reinvent the Internet every time. And, you know, you have to look cool while doing it and all the things like it's, it's a ridiculous amount of pressure um, that is put on fintechs. And, and just that's my personal view. Um, and, and Liz and I, we were talking, you know, before it started, I, I think a, a better title to the book might have been think like a brand, not a blank, because I, I think if you take the word bank out and put whatever it is that you do for work in, it still very much applies. Because like when we were talking about the dangers of blank sheet thinking and the dangers of just huge wholesale changes that just mathematically and physically wreck your momentum. That's a huge temptation for fintechs because you have to be different every single day. Whereas for banks, it's acceptable, maybe not preferable, but it is acceptable to be stuck in the 1950s. It's almost sure. a trope. Sure. So, um, so I think for, for fintechs, I, I still think all of this applies. Because um, remember, it's not about, we didn't write a book about if you have the sexiest website, you'll win. We, that's not what we're saying. Or if you have the coolest logo, you will win or your, your hats are cool. It is, a, it is a mentality and a business model that carries through more than marketing. And that's probably where it gets a bit difficult on the fintech side because um, everyone thinks they're a marketer. <laughs> and, yeah. Right, yeah, I, yeah. And so, you know, it's like, well, how hard can it be? And so... Coaching and composing the mindset of the difference between marketing and brand thinking is hard. It's hard, hard work. Um, but I, I, like I said, I think the examples, the exercises in the book um, absolutely apply. I mean, I'm biased. I do work for FinTech. So I, I have tried these at home uh, mm -hmm. and they work. <laughs> so um, Liz, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, um, again, one conversation I had recently was how you can think about the, you know, the, the technology roadmap is always the, like, the big kind of pressure point in, in any fintech. And I think in particular, the, the idea of Q, the remix, is really a valuable part. So when you're particularly in that rapid scaling of a fintech, if you're in a kind of more SaaS startup environment, then the temptation is to pump out more and more and more features and functions. Whereas actually, mm. if you take the time to look at what have you got, what are your strengths, how can we package that? And is there an audience for what we have? And to an extent, that's kind of where we were heading at, uh, at Nimbus is saying, look, we've got all of these components that we have created. How can we put these together to make the sum of the parts more valuable than the individuals by identifying an audience or a niche? then there's a real opportunity in that kind of cue the remix when you are prepared to take a step back. You know, it's really easy when you're running in that kind of big, you know, hockey stick world. But actually, if you're really focused on what can you do with what you've got, you'll probably find mm -hmm. that it's a lot more than, you know, and a lot easier 
than just continuing to to build more and more and more. So I think that one's a yeah. big one for fintech. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're taking the route of wanting to do something better than a bank, getting to brand thinking faster will put you in a great spot. Um, and yeah. the gaps between bank thinking and brand thinking. There are so many business and product opportunities. If you just get a sheet of paper and, and really put that down, so many opportunities to, to do that and, and you know to acquire more customers in financial services, you need to stay ahead of where banks are going strategically, right? I mean, the best ones are already moving that way. Like it's super fun to pull up the backwards bank, but we also can't fool ourselves that they're all headed this way. There are many <laughs> that are headed yeah. that way as well. Um, so, you know, there's many that have already moved to, to brand thinking. So I think the other piece I would just caution is don't, I don't want this to sound offensive. Don't get too smug that everyone is backwards because yeah. they're not and why that matters is because with the scale and the span that they have, they are essentially pacemakers. And so you don't want to lose your position, right? In terms of creating trend because someone has, because the pacemakers have sort of changed it on you. So the same can happen in reverse. Um, so that's just sort of a, a caution and something to think about. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that, I think is we 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 actually have a, a chapter in the book called you know quit fighting fintechs, and mm -hmm. I think that actually applies the other way around as well. Is that mm -hmm. there is a lot of opportunity for for partnership, and, and one of the things that's interesting to me is the the proliferation of banking as a service providers who are taking their charter, and actually they have a lot of control on which fintechs succeed. So you know I've worked with the uh, a couple of the, the big kind of players in the US and they are very particular about which fintechs they are able or willing to support and then they put a great deal of constraints on the ability of the fintech to grow and, and organize because they recognize that the truly valuable thing in that relationship is the charter. So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on creating the mutual value, which we talk about in the book, between the fintechs and the banks. Because to me, that's really where the future is. If those two, the two parts of the business are growing symbiotically, are moving more towards brand thinking together, that's going to make a bigger win for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Um, the, the pain point that I hear or the struggle that I hear from marketing, uh, people in marketing in um, in fintechs is that a lot of fintech companies are founded by uh, specialist or, or technical people um, mm -hmm. and so it can often be difficult to you know ask for a bigger marketing budget if they don't see results right and especially brands you know imagine you're starting from scratch getting the benefits of brand is going to take years probably right um, so how would you recommend to marketers in this position yes make the business use case but how are there any other things that you've found works when it comes to um, helping these marketers basically explain why it's important to invest in a brand ASAP? Yeah. No, um, Sorry, I didn't have very... time. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Um, someone... yeah. So I think, you know, it, it, I'm going to say some things that sound easy, but with the recognition that it's, that it's not. So, you're not you're not asking for a marketing budget mm -hmm. that's easy to cut what you're what you're proposing is brand momentum and it's not just bs words it's literally how you construct your budget and i'm happy to like literally send a copy of how i propose mine um and it's not 100 percent foolproof but it is you have to make it harder to say no. It is e it's easy for me as a CMO to say no to some marketing activities when I'm faced with like 
huge budget cuts. It's like, well, do we really need to do a webinar? Probably not. But a webinar is not at your brand, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you're, what's really on the table is, as a brand, how fast do we want our momentum to go? And, and you know, you mentioned that you know brand benefit would come, you know, in years. I disagree. Marketing benefit will come mm -hmm. in years. Trying to do a webinar on day one when no one can spell your company's name versus three years hence is different. But the brand momentum, that emotional connection that brings that financial business case. We've all seen brands come out of nowhere that people love and we're like, what the hell? Like, what do they, you know, that's what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you're essentially funding. And so having examples of that versus I need this money to do these things so that we get X, Y, Z impressions, da, 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 da. Product isn't what it used to be and marketing speak has never been what it used to be. So, yeah. so just like you shouldn't use product language for a bank customer, you should not use marketing language for a non-marketing colleague. Um, sure. You've got to think about you are building brand momentum that lifts all boats. Uh -huh. And if they were to ask, okay, what is brand momentum? How do you respond? Sure. Yeah. Well, I think um, I, I would give examples. I would give ex you know, visual examples, right? Because the worst thing you can do is kind of have a tete-a-tete, -tete, like, you know, I mean, we're not arguing, but like, you know, like this isn't going to take you over the edge to make you believe me. Um, it's going to be visual examples, right? But brand momentum means an increase in awareness in the investor community. Brand momentum means higher sales at a higher ACV. Brand momentum means higher retention for your customer success. You know, so just kind of going through that and then the speed to market, right? If you want to be product led, developing a perfect product will take years. Mm -hmm. Developing a perfect brand doesn't. And people buy into the brand long before they buy into the product. So there's a speed to market component as well. So the question is, do you want to take some action that will keep or increase funding, that will reduce the cost of acquisition, and that will increase speed to market of our technology without increased engineering hours? Mm -hmm. If you answer yes to those, Bob, then <laughs> what you're saying is you want to build brand momentum. And I can do that for you. And it costs a billion dollars. Yeah. So it gives you the billion dollars. It works exactly like this every time. No, um, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's sort of the framework that we would prefer folks approach it as because the minute it becomes a marketing exercise, the minute it becomes the responsibility of a single department, you've exposed yourself to massive risk, massive cuts, and a lifetime of explaining what marketing is, which is an awful life. So don't do that. And, yeah, and that comes back, you know, what you've just described, there's three things. That's exactly, you know, right at the top of the call, we talked about how do you value a brand? And that's how the Cantor study values those brands, yeah? And that means you can say, look, we've got proof. These are the three things. This is how you value a brand. We're building a brand and it delivers returns. So you can always link it back to that. Yeah, no, I really like that. That's really useful. Because I, to me, what, what I see is basically it's, it's hard like in theory, it sounds great, but in practice, it can be tough. And it's about having those those the right conversations. Um, and by the way, anyone who's listening, feel free to put the questions in the chat. I have one question that I want. It's a little bit it's kind of tangential, but not exactly, which is, and this is more for people who are fintechs that are a lot more earlier stage. But what happens if you don't really know like what resonates with your audience? Basically, you're still trying to figure out your brand. Right. And mm -hmm. so they totally agree with what you're saying. They're like, yeah, we need to build a black brand from day one, but they don't know what the colors are. They don't know. Okay. Well, I shouldn't use that as an example because you said that's colors. okay. But, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that they don't really have, they're still figuring things out, but they really want yeah. to implement a brand from day one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. How would you go about that? Totally get that question all the time. So what I would say is, is this 
you, you actually do have a brand when you're starting up and that brand is you mm-hmm. because it is yep. you going in front of the VCs and PEs and it is you going to friends and family. So you are the brand that you need yep. to start with. And brands are not permanent, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you go out and, you know, call it Alice the Nets or Inc., but, you know, I'm an outdoors person, which is why, you know, Liz looks so fancy and I do not. And, but that's my brand yep. and I'm super comfortable with it. It costs me nothing. I already own the clothes. So that's where I start, right? So I'm, I'm sort yeah. of joking, but I'm serious is yeah. you, you have a brand today. You are already getting business results today because you've gotten a loan or your parents to loan you the money, you've gotten space, you've gotten some contractors that agree to work with you. So you already have that brand momentum. And yeah, you probably will change it and get fancier as time goes on and become more like Liz, but you don't have to do that from the beginning. And people may not trust it right from the beginning. I yeah. think Alison referred to the, the pyramid um, that's in the book. Um, Honestly, that's where you start. So to Alison's point, when, you know, you are the brand. What's your philosophy? What's your purpose? Why are you setting this up? What are you trying to do? That is the foundation of a brand. And you just get more and more sophisticated as you grow the business, as you bring partners in. And really, I mean, when Alison and I are working with, um, you know, new kind of startup bank and credit union brands, we take them through that pyramid. And eventually you do get to the colors because that's a really important part of it. You get to the logo and that's when everyone gets super excited. But you have Mm -hmm. to do the foundational work, which is the why. Why are we doing this? The who are we doing it for? What are we giving back? What are we delivering? And as long as you always do that foundation in whichever way, at whatever scale you do, you will be building a brand. There's an example that you use in the book, which I really liked. I can't remember the name of the credit union or the bank, but it was um, they used to offer banking services to lumberjacks, right? Mm. And um, obviously they'd expanded since then. They were like a bank with many uh, branches and all that. But going back to the brand, they went back in history, essentially, right? Why, why do we set up this bank in the first place? And translate it to 2022, the way you translate it is by... Um, offering services to people in remote locations because that was lumberjacks right so I really liked how that history or that like why it started translates into a USP essentially of this bank Mm -hmm. what makes it different and a brand yeah Yeah. right yeah absolutely yeah Uh, that's Umqua Bank one of our favorite examples yeah 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 quoted quoted a lot yeah it was cool it took me about 18 months to learn how to pronounce it and I'm not entirely (laughs) sure I still can so (laughs) Uh, but yeah they're they're very good what about fintech uh example because we've talked about banking examples you've mentioned square slash block um i know in the book you talk a lot about current which i think is also a very cool fintech company so Mm -hmm. would you mind talking about current what is as a brand why are they so good what have they nailed I'll, I'll take that one as it's um, that is how I run my my family finances so I have um, teenage children and um, what current did is they've got their conventional bank accounts you know they've had those you know savings as kids but there was very little that I could do with that apart from put money into it I think what current have done really well is understand the pain points of parenting, of managing pocket money, of trying to teach the value of money to to kind of the the next generation. So for those that are not familiar with current, it basically allows you to set chores for your children to earn money. And they have different, uh, you know, it's basically a prepaid card essentially that you can control what they spend. You can allow them only to spend so much in say, uh, you know, fast food or the internet or, you know, whatever you want to do. And they have the opportunity to work for their pocket money. And it's very transparent and you can use it as rewards. And um, it really did solve uh, a problem which no financial institution had really solved before. And for me, that was, that's why I love it as a brand, because it's very clearly identified a gap in the market. 
a real pain point and it's solved it with some really excellent technology and a very cool that my kids love their current cats the, the cars themselves just look amazing they love them they're very you know like they're like, yeah. they're like you cool know. right yeah and if i can make a shameless plug um liz keeps up a twitter account brand before bank b4 so maybe liz if you want to put that in the chat but yeah. she puts on there uh near daily really cool examples and inspirations mm. to follow that are you know global uh in nature uh because the u.s has by no means cornered the market on cool i just want to put that out there for everyone yeah. um so follow that as well um uh, because i personally discover new uh, FinTech brands that I have not heard of um, uh, from following that. So. What's a new favorite of yours? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's the only reason I go on Twitter. Otherwise, I think it's successful. <laughs> no, I mean, what, what, is there a new FinTech that's a favorite of yours? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, um, FinTech-wise, I love the Cash App. I think that that... Mm, yeah, they're great. It's not just about brand creation. That's a great story of brand evolution, how they started as kind of um, trying to solve the, um, you know, going down to the, the bodega or the corner store, kind of that predatory type practice to now being cool um, and how they've used influence for marketing and some other things to do that. So I like them because they sure as heck are not, they didn't start where they are now. And I think that's important to remember that the things that look so cool now look like garbage uh, you know, before. Uh, and the cash app is one of them. It looked like it was on a typewriter previously and now it's, it's really cool. Um, and another one, it's not, um, you know, maybe your kids wouldn't think it's cool, but I appreciate the content is audiobook. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a, a fan of just the clarity of their language. Um, I'm a fan of their CMO, uh, Derek Sutton. So that's another one to look. It's an it's an old fintech, but I think it it goes to show that you know not everything has to be new, shiny, and you know run by super super young people. You can also have really really good stuff, um, even if you're not in that camp. What were they called? Auto Bank. Auto Books. Oh, Auto Books. Yeah, I'll put it in here. Auto Books. Um, yeah. Cool. We have a few more minutes for questions if anyone wants to post uh, them. I had one other interesting question just because, okay, well, Annie, oh, well, we'll ask Annie's and if there's time, I'll ask one. Um, Annie, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, so basically my, my question would be, you know, it's always tricky and what I find a very you know, a, a big challenge um, in fintech is like eventually, you know, everyone kind of like starts sounding pretty much like what we have now in the banking, you know, in the beginning, you have all these like bold brands with the, let's say the pastel colors and everything. And now suddenly everyone else is kind of following, you know, trying that thinking that, okay, this is what challengers are. And, you know, we, we have to be, I don't know, neon or pastel or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how you actually, you know, how can you make sure that you, you know, you're not blending in, uh, in whatever like trends, uh, you know, happening out there, you know, just trying to, you know, I mean, it, and I think that's like a million dollar question, right? You know, how to differentiate, but if you have any tips and I think, I guess you go back to the basics again, the foundation and the value, yeah. but yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. from a more kind of like practical, um yeah I don't know like and maybe going back to your to the c-suite and the board and, and and the founders for example if it's a very early stage startup you know how you actually any tips on you know navigate that conversation and communication and and kind of like make them think outside of the box I guess <laughs> yeah I mean I'll 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 say the one yeah. thing that I always come back to is and I'll say data, but I don't just mean numbers. So for example, where, you know, Alice and I would come up against many challenges of people 
you know, boards not wanting to take what we feel is a necessary step to build their brand. And you build a, you build a case about it. So if you're thinking about visual identity, one of the things that our, our design team always did for us is we would agree what the competitive market was for the particular bank or credit union we were working with. And they would do a complete pool of all the visual identity, the messaging, the positioning of all those competitors. And when you put them all together, kind of like we did with the mission statements in the book, you can see very clearly where there's me too-ness and you can see really clearly where there's white space. So my, my kind of the, the win to that is evidence. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would, yes, complete and, and making it, you know, again, we're, we're speaking to non-marketers, right? So it's not about, yeah. you know, but, but just doing Liz kind of exercise where you just do a simple color wheel. Right. And you yeah. just say, okay, who are your top 10, put their names on a color wheel and then put yourself. And yeah. so you do the same thing with messaging. What are, you know, what is, what are the five repeated phrases on their site, all the competitors, and then you, and again, it's not, okay, well then if we're all in the same boat, let's just throw everything out and yeah, go neon or go whatever it does go back to that pyramid, which is, if you want to go neon, for example, is that, is that true to your brand personality? Is it not? Because here's something that's also important to think about with differentiation. We tend to think of differentiation as a shortcut to growth, that if I'm different, that I will be noticed. But that's not always the case, and that's not always the route to growth. You can also be the best, right? You can, <laughs> you can look and feel the same and also just be the effing best at what you do. Yeah. And so I, I think that, that, that we put a tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves as marketers to constantly create, to constantly be new, to constantly be different because we have the crayons in our hands, <laughs> right? But we have other tools in our toolkit. And I think that is what we're trying to make the point of, which is you have more than visual identity and messaging and positioning as your tool, right? Yeah. You have, business, you have business models, you have product ideas, you have lots of things at your disposal. And sometimes it's not about being different. It's just about being better. I mean, I don't know how many more lifestyle images of Gen Z <laughs> on a skateboard with newspaper, you know, like all that shit. Like, okay, but are you insanely good at whatever it is that you choose to do? Because by not doing that, we're not giving the consumers or the businesses the credit and respect that they can make a good choice. And if you don't believe that, that's going to come through no matter what you choose. If you don't think they know how to pick a good horse, that's going to come through in everything that you do from a brand standpoint. So you got to have the belief that when presented with the information, they're going to make the best choice for them and respect that choice. And then everything else kind of, you know, falls in line. Great. Yeah. Very valid oh, points. Great. Thanks, Alison. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. No problem. Very good, good place to end. Uh, very powerful message there. Um, where, where can people find you online? Obviously, there's think uh, like a brand, not a bank. dot com. Is that it? I can't remember. Uh, no, it is think like a brand book. dot com. Like just put book. it in chat. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank so you. there, you know, we have like why you should listen to us, but we also have links to podcasts and then all the all the stuff that we talked about, like the charts and the slides, all that you can download on the website. Just download it, change the colors, put it in your deck. We do not care. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, where you find us. And then Liz on Twitter is a great one. Yeah, this is, yeah, perfect. Well, thanks so much. This was really enlightening yeah. and super interesting. Really appreciate you coming on. And thanks to everyone who came live and have a good rest of your evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.